All right, I guess we can start. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Alexey Krobrov, and I'm a Source Science Director at IBM Research and yeah. our Accelerate Discovery team. And uh, my colleague Tim Bonneman, he is the community lead, uh, is gonna co-present with me. So uh, maybe some of you have seen us at the Open Source Science booth. So uh, I will explain what Open Source Science is and what uh, the relationship to IBM and non-focus it has. And a map of science is a project of open source science, right? And it's an initiative. So uh, it's, it's a working group. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the, uh, the ideas and the data and the uh, goals of this project. And hopefully some of you can um, join us in it or send some folks who can benefit from this. Right, so, um, so open source science is an initiative uh, which is IBM's open source strategy for science, right? So I joined IBM Research uh, three years ago, first as a technical lead for quantum uh, ecosystem development, and then we started um, a new team called Accelerator Discovery, which basically solves hard problems of humanity uh, with science, such as material discovery, carbon capture materials for fighting climate change, new drugs to fight cancer and diseases, um, model climate change for sustainability research. Uh, so basically, really hard problems which involve, uh, on the one hand, they involve uh, deep science, right? So you need to model uh, climate data, you need to model uh, chemical materials, and uh, obviously there is a lot of work for machine learning and AI and now foundation models. On the other hand, you need to use a lot of software, you need to use a lot of tools. And it turns out that scientists uh, approach software differently than professional software engineers. I wonder who here comes from a scientific background or who had substantial kind of scientific background at some point. I know Harold had or some others, right? So just to get, take a pause, okay. And who likes science, who likes to, who cares about interesting problems solving those science, right? So I guess the, there is motivation uh, on kind of both sides of this, uh, because scientists really need open source tools, right? Scientists usually do not have too much money and scientists work collaboratively. So scientists are wired by their DNA uh, to do, to use open source. Uh, on the other hand, the difference that scientists have uh, against uh, kind of traditional open source developers, such you know, as us in the Bay Area, and I come, you know, I spend this ball the grounds, right? So I've been in startups, I've been in Amazon, and I've been at you know scientific labs. Uh, developers generally uh, have the mechanisms of data exchange wired into them. You know to find blogs, you know to find tweets, you know who to follow, right? You know who in your area is an authority. So a conference like this is our professional tool of dissemination of information, right? Like, you know, you come to a summit like this, it's divided by tracks, it's divided by area. You like JavaScript, you go to Open, Open GS Summit. You like machine learning there, you come here, right? You generally know where to find stuff and you know where to present stuff. So scientists do this for their areas, right? They do this for subject research. They, they have conferences for physics and they have conferences uh, for chemistry and plasma physics, like, and, and so forth. And they have, you know, uh, the American you know, Chemical Society has a massive congress in the same place where Databricks has the data and the summit. But, you know, in, we attend both, and, and they're extremely dif different, right? If you put up an open source science sign at a Databricks conference, you'll see a lot of people. If you do it in a chemical society, they'll get all your swag and not necessarily ask you, right? Because then, like, looking for chemistry, not necessarily software yet. So what we need to do, we need to connect scientists with open source developers in an efficient fashion. So what we've done, so our strategy is basically community-centric. We created open source science at NumFocus. IBM is a general sponsor at NumFocus for many years, and so we inherited this relationship and upgraded it. And NumFocus, who knows about NumFocus? Let's say this. Who knows about Jupiter, pandas? NumPy, SciPy, any of this, right? So all of you generally know the projects which sits under NumFocus, and nobody knows that you know they are under NumFocus. So that's a, a nonprofit set up by Travis Elephant to host NumPy, 
NumPy is the most installed open source project of all time, compared to according to some metrics. It's the foundation of any data science uh, library in Python, right? And um, basically, over the years, there is about 80 different projects, including Scikit-Learn, Pandas, right, which is huge and used everywhere. Uh, but NumFocus is, is kind of small compared to Linux Foundation, and, and uh, people mostly know its projects. So, uh, so we have this initiative there as a top level uh, a group uh, spanning basically all, all activities. And the goal is to first, we need to understand the communities of scientists who use open source software. So the goal of this is to accelerate science with software, not produce more software with more software, which is usually software people do, right? Like if you have two pieces of software, there will be third piece of software to connect the two pieces of software. So we have a self-perpetuating, you know, virt virtuous ecosystem, right? But scientists generally don't care about software. Like if all the software will disappear and cancer will be solved, cancer scientists will probably take the deal, right? So it's kind of the, the, the and for us it's very hard to comprehend, right? Because we live in software and we enjoy software. So uh, it's like to see somebody whose end goal is not better software but something else, it's, it's, it's new. Uh, and, and scientists are basically very passionate about their scientific research. So they will use tools, whatever necessary. They will use paid Windows lab software because that's what they have. And if they cannot use it, you know, they'll not usually try to break it, right? Like you need their colleagues who are research software engineers uh, it's a new term kind of emerging, who basically care about science, but no software, no hardware, no data pipelines, right? So, so we need to find these people. And, and we go after them in the same fashion that we do software engineering communities like this one, right? You find people who are passionate about domain. So if you want to do a conference on big data, you find people who are good at Spark, right? And like uh, and Hadoop previously, and, and you, you find, you know, interesting topics they usually do in their companies and you invite them to share and they come and share, right? Because uh, this is like the people like to share best practices. Uh, if you, you know, look for open source science people, you find scientists who are good at software. And this is a very tricky situation because they need to know enough about their domain, right? To have kind of bird's eye view, uh, to kind of do really impactful things it's easy to find kind of graduate students focused on their own little niche. It's harder to find somebody who makes choices and drives some impactful software. And so, and so far we basically spent a year, it's been started at SciPy in uh, Austin, uh, which is now a major non-focused conference. And uh, it's, so this is, I think, the trick. So this, uh, this is very much social engineering. So once we have the communities, right, so we have interest groups by, by vertical, uh, and we find the right people, right? Then we basically uh, want to find what is the agenda, what, what field, uh, what software can advance this field forward, right? Uh, and and they basically identify gaps and needs, right? So some uh, research needs features in existing software projects, and some projects don't exist and need to be created. So like LabVIEW dominates. Uh, lab automation, it's a Windows program which uses RS-232 port, right? Like it's hard to find people who understand how to replace it by an open source piece of software and most sites are not interested in this, right? So a lot of lab automation actually, the kind of top nerds in lab automation apparently they use LabVIEW and they extracted weird data into an Excel spreadsheet. Like this is the top automation. And now so data is liberated and now can be put it the CSV file and now can be put through some motions, right? Like this is the level. Uh, a lot of stuff is in, in completely proprietary equipment like CampSpeed makes this amazing AI driven robots, right? But it's all closed source, they have some uh, open source pieces, uh, but that's not how they think, right? Like it's not their main goal. So, uh, in the, so once we know, right, we have the communities of open source developers and scientists who care about specific verticals, uh, now we have, uh, we identify some needs and gaps. And then next phase we could direct resources to this because there is now a huge amount of grants, huge amount of initiatives in Europe and in the US, you know, NSF, OECD, Horizon 2020. So all of these initiatives, uh, EU level, government level, regional level, right, they direct funding to open source science. So science has an advantage over industrial open source that Science is generally 
and expense. Nobody expects to make money in science. Science is government spending, in general, or non-profit spending and charitable spending. So most science is financed by governments. So for instance, NASA is ahead of everybody else in cloud, in open source, as if compared to government agencies. And the reason is nobody will sell you Galaxy data, right? Like it's free. You will not make money out of it usually. So, and, and also it's vast amounts of data, right? So they had to figure out how to handle this data and process this data on a government budget, right? But, but the government kind of pays for uh, equipment, so they, they approach cloud, they create workflows, right? And they not, don't necessarily come to the things people use in Silicon Valley because very often they're not aware of this and they do not have incentives to come to meetups in Silicon Valley. So it's very interesting that the information in science spreads through usually the verticals. So whatever chemists use now is used by chemists. And what's even more interesting, so the scientific Python ecosystem, so this is a scientific Python project, which is another top level project of NaFocus. And so that's been going on for many years. Jared Millman is one of the co-founders. And uh, these folks basically created Jupiter, right? So. Um, there is a lot of great foundational projects we now use due to the scientific Python community. So uh, scientific Python community uses Dask for concurrency. And in Silicon Valley, we have Ray for training LLMs, right? And when Ray folks present to SciPy, literally, you, you can find users yet, right? Because Dask emerged through the Vine as a way for uh, SciPy people to, to do concurrency. And, and so, so you, you clearly see it's, it's not always a technical. In this case, it's just not a technical choice. It's a question who knows who. And people who did Dask, they operated in the community for a long time. Same thing with Jupyter. So the people who do Jupyter Hub come from the community, right? So the tools are self-selecting, mostly on use. And the situation, you know, is an industry where you have tight competition, benchmarking. Uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, necessarily, uh, you know, in the case in science. So, so these are the interest groups we have so far. We have uh, groups on uh, chemistry, material science, healthcare and life sciences, climate sustainability. They reflect IBM's priorities in research, and everybody else is welcome to stand up their own groups. So we have currently folks, you know, who want to do more. And then we have horizontal groups which span technologies. So reproducible science, everybody cares about reproducibility. Everybody means different thing, right? To, to scientists, five views of reproducibility. So that's something we, we are very you know, active in. Uh, we sponsored the first ACM conference on reproducibility, which was held in June at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, we have an interest group on this. And the, another uh, interest group in the map of science, right? And so map of science is uh, an effort to map all of open source used for science. And so this will be the, the uh, next part. I just briefly mentioned, so we're, this is our partners, Nonfocus, CCI, OSPAS around the world. So if you have an OSPA, usually we partner with OSPAS. And uh, IBM works with a lot of companies and directly, so we can bring this. Uh, and this group is called uh, Future of Software. So these are actually representatives of uh, innovation uh, ministries and government agencies around the world, which met in Amsterdam last year, and now they're meeting in Montreal. And they're basically drafting Amsterdam Declaration of Sustainable Research Software. So the idea is that research software should be done with community, it should be findable, it should be you know, built according to the best standards, and that way it will persist. And so we, we actually find that it's extremely well overlapping with our mission, right? So once we map, and we find where the software is and which software actually drives science, it brings visibility to, to, to that software and hopefully makes, you know, brings the resources to make it sustainable. So this is a bunch of organizations supporting us. So what is the map of science? So when we started this, we understood that basically uh, we want to get to the future where science is driven by open source, where open source mentality drives science. And open source mentality means, you know, people basically, you know, uh, rewarded on merit, right? If you contribute code, everybody recognizes it's useful. 
you get a lot of you know, uh, acceptance in the open source project, you contribute. Your open source projects is used by multiple organizations. Uh, there is clear ways to see validation and, and merit in, uh, in open source, which is often harder to get in traditional science because a lot of it is kind of social trust ne network, which is kind of like a church, right? It's a hierarchical system which evolved over the centuries and a lot of knowledge is kept by senior scientists and kind of junior scientists, apprentice, and kind of earn the, the trust of the community, which has its own important merit. But these two systems are now bound to collide, right? And so inevitably, open source will disrupt science. It will not uh, supersede it, but the kind of merit system which comes from open source, will more and more uh, connect, right, interweave with scientific recognition. And so now a lot of scientists, junior scientists who do software, they complain that their software is not recognized as contribution as much as papers, but uh, it will change. Now, you know, you can cite uh, software in the Journal of Open Source Software. You can uh, make publications and hopefully that will be more and more counting as, as a result. So uh, what are the objects in the map of science? Uh, it's, it's hard to drive this by product market research as startups do, right? Like usually if you have Uber for pets, you kind of have an idea. You can hire a product manager and they will interview a bunch of pet owners and you know, what do they need you know, from uh, an Uber which will drive them. But here, uh, there are multiple incentives, multiple views. So we need to hypothesize. And we need to basically do it in a kind of Steve Jobs fashion, right? We need to put it out, and we need to get users to it. So uh, the entities we have are papers, people, right? That's traditional science. Then we want to know teams and labs which, where people, these people live, because usually labs have a theme. Uh, and they have an org organizations. It matters where organizations are because usually the funding and the priority are dictated by their national affiliation, their national um, uh, kind of agenda, but also different universities are famous for different things, like schools of economics. You know, if you want to study specific kinds of economics, you go to a given university. University of Chicago does it one way, University of Pennsylvania another way. And so different universities are known as sites for excellence in different sciences, right? You do material science, you go to University of Chicago and, and, and University of Illinois and so forth. Um, and uh, so, so we need to know these organizations. Of course, OSS projects. So uh, papers now started to cite OSS projects. It's not uniform. There is no way like to standardize this. People are starting to do the node and DOIs. But again, there is no widespread practice. Most normal, often you will get a URL, right? And actually, sometimes you need to normalize the URL. And sometimes the URLs are duplicated, like repositories can be forked. So, so there is another la layer where you need to understand what projects are and if you can identify them. Uh, then sometimes you have initiatives. You have, you know, some universities have a whole labs, like Berkeley has RISE lab, which produces Ray, but it also produces other things, right? And previously they had the AMP lab, which produced Spark uh, and uh, Mesos, uh, Tachyon, uh, Luxio, a lot of three kind of startups which came out of AMP lab. So you need to know kind of the overarching kind of agenda of a lab. And then, of course, there are grants, right? In academia, everybody spends their time writing grants. And if you are an administrator, you actually want to know which department is most effectively attracting grants to do research. And then if you show that all these grants are spending, a lot of this is spent on open source software, you will get an equivocal buy-in from, from the administration because they may not care about your priority, but if you see you're you attracting funding very successfully, you're funding students, and you're actually funding open source in your university, they will pay attention. So this is what the University of California Santa Cruz has done. They looked at how university commercializes intellectual property. So there is an IP transfer office in every university. And you can actually now you know, attribute the income to open source used in a grant, which was used to produce this IP. Right, so this is a very innovative way to, to come to the administration with you know, a table showing that millions of dollars were received uh, due to open source. That way you'll always have attention of you know, any kind of administration. So, so this is a very important thing, and 
would like to be able to do this, right? Um, and uh, the user, so the users are, as I just described, some kind of administrators, supervisors who actually drive activities in science, uh, scientists themselves who need to discover uh, open source used in the area if they're not yet fully familiar with this, if their small group is maybe isolated, maybe they're starting now, they no, may not know this, they may just not be users of open source software, software in general, they may be starting now. And developers, right? There are passionate developers who are kind of tired to write ads and, you know, as David Parton famously said, you know, the best minds of our generation are put to follow clicks online. Is this a good use of our time? And he called in 2015 for developers to fight cancer. And actually, you know, some of the developers joined some of these biotech labs. Of course, very few, but um, this is kind of, for some people, it's a meaningful activity, and they're looking for it maybe as a part-time hobby activity. They want to make an impact in something uh, affecting uh, scientific research, right? So, so there is a lot of important motivation. Open source developers are motivated by, you know, passion. So, so this is a very good way to give them a way to apply their passion to, to something meaningful. So and now team will talk a little bit about uh, a prototype of science that we built recently. Uh, do you want me to go to the browser right away? Uh, yeah, go to Okay. All right. Let's see. I think I need to first get out of here, and then I can go here. I probably can maximize that. All right. Great. Hi, everyone. So I recently had a chance to go to Greece for a com conference uh, that brought together 300 computational chemists. And uh, I just started to ask them, do you use open source in your work? What kind of tools? And uh, it was very interesting. And so we just started to um, create a bit of a, a demo uh, that we can use at events like this and at the booth to get you know, the conversation started. So we're using a, a tool called Kumu. And uh, basically, we just uh, plug in these, uh, these tools. This is like a, the first iteration here. You can see maybe um, dimly there these orange dots. These are uh, open source tools that are used in computational chemistry. And then I went ahead and pulled the list of contributors from GitHub and GitLab. And so after just a few more tools being added, you can see that there are people emerging that are contributing to more than one tool. These dots in between those uh, little bubbles there. And uh, fairly quickly, you get the view. This is like 17 tools, and I can enlarge it here. And you can see there's people, obviously, that are contributing to more than one, some even more than two or three uh, projects. Now, that is not in itself an earth-shattering insight. Um, but if you look here in the, um, in the bottom corner there, those are actually two papers. And here we see these are four authors that have, uh, you know, published both of these papers. And if you zoom in, what you can't see yet because we're using the real names from archive and the usernames from GitHub. Um, but what I have confirmed manually is that one of these, at least one of the authors, is also a contributor to this uh, project. And so now with, uh, I need you to use your imagination. Uh, imagine a, you know, a, 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 a map that has, you know, hundreds and hundreds of open source tools in a domain and maybe tens of thousands of research papers. Um, and more fidelity in terms of you know the, the the people knowing like who's the main contributor, who's just an occasional contributor, um, and maybe you can even double click on some of these people and see find out more about them, see which communities they might be involved in, or where they hang out online, where they discuss their science, and hopefully it will, on the one hand, increase um, or improve discoverability of existing tools, so you don't always have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, 
but also it might encourage people to just connect earlier in the scientific process with the folks that are already in their little uh, area of interest. Um, and um, I hope that makes sense as a, as a concept. Of course, we have you know, a lot, lot more work to do to, to flesh this out, but um, uh, it definitely helped us to get feedback, uh, talking to these scientists uh, as they imagine how they would use such a tool, and, uh, and we could discuss some of the, uh, the use cases, you know, some feature requests and some uh, questions around um, tools that aren't strictly open source but are free for academic use and so on. So it was a very helpful exercise to get this, get this going. Uh, we are currently finishing up the um, high-level concept for this map and uh, we'll move it forward from there. All right, Alexi, I'm going back to the, um, were there more slides? I think so, yeah? Fifteen minutes left, so let's use it for um, for a discussion, right? So I wonder, you guys are all, you know, OSS OGs, right? So you kind of understand how software works, and a lot of you have scientific interests, right? So we kind of, right? So we think, why do we need this? When we tell this to folks that we want to build this, and the reason is very simple: we want to go somewhere. You need the map. You cannot. You cannot find out how to get from A to B. You cannot route unless you know where A is and where B is, right? Where B is, we know. We want to be in the beautiful world where science is permeated by software and everybody is a, is a developer. LLMs can give it you know, to us in some way, but uh, not immediately and not meaningfully yet, right? So we need to, to build this map, uh, but exactly the details different and kind of folks Generally, people agree this is a great idea, and if this is not a research project, this is not a PDF. This is not something you want to do once. This should be a living and useful portal. And so initially, when we actually started, we were very ambitious. We thought, we'll need to build a portal for science. There is no social network for science. If you think, what scientists exchange information? Generally, they go to LinkedIn and they go to Twitter. So Twitter is a machine for URL exchange, right? People, professionals generally share URLs on Twitter. So that's how you find software. That's how you find papers, right? Uh, so 60% of kind of scientific URLs between scientists contain a, a tweets contain a URL, uh, right? We thought of, you know, things like scientific bundle. If we build this map, we can let people put together papers, ideas, code, and maybe send it to other people and say, hey, what do you think of applying kind of this algorithm to this data, maybe data sets, right? Data sets should be indexed, of course, as well. So, so that's kind of the general idea. Uh, and uh, uh, we're gonna have the first uh, workshop funded by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative at their headquarters. Uh, the, they basically selected 50 top researchers in bibliography, meta research, uh, and open source for science. And this is gonna be run in Redwood City in their headquarters. This is by invitation only. Uh, if you want to be invited to the next one, let us know, uh, right? So this is so. When this, this is going to be a hackathon, so we're going to build a chunk of this. Uh, we're uh, applying for grants with nonprofit foundations to get developers to do this, right? Because it's a, it's a build-intensive project. Uh, these are our communication channels. So I just leave it here as our URL. If you go to this URL, which is our name and also our URL, you can sign up for the newsletter. So, but I just wanted to kind of leave it here, right? and ask you guys, uh, what do you think? If you have questions, if you have, if you have suggestions, if you have feedback, and maybe we'll use this remaining time as a Q&A and discussion, because we really want to know, you know the opinion of this group. And don't be shy. Any, any kind of question, if you didn't understand something or you object to something, it's, it's, all, it's all good. Okay, we have a question. Good. Hello. Um, thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, it sounds like you need to um, motivate the scientists to actively um, yeah, do something to in enhance this map of science, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you uh, would like to 
motivate the people that are already swamped with paper deadlines and work to do and so on? Excellent question. Uh, are you, do you work with scientists? Do you know? Because it's very deep. You, you, you get at the heart of the problem. I've uh, been a scientist, but uh, I switched to industry by now. <laughs> very good. Yes. So that, that shines. Thank you for that. All right. So this is very typical. And so this summer we did open source science on rails. We went from Chicago Open Source Science Symposium. We started to SAP in Austin, and by the, on the way we stopped by St. Louis University. So the incoming dean of engineering uh, used to run open open science foundation framework. Right, which was basically this kind of software. It's kind of replacement for lab notebooks. So it requires scientists to go back and file their research. And of course, what happens, they stop doing this, right? Like scientists have enough stuff to do than to fill out forms. And like, I mean, it's, it's generally it's a, it's a thankless task to, to ask people to classify themselves, come up with ontologies, right? Like if you, like ontologies is the end of this. Like once you start argument ontologies, Things are done, right? So, so we want to very carefully avoid this. So we thought of different te technical approaches. So first of all, at IBM, we have a project called Deep Search, and many others like this exist. So now you can basically slurp the whole archive.org into a search engine, and then you, get, you can brute force extract mentions of, of URLs, right? So, and then you, you can use classification to understand what the paper is about. It already has some classification to begin with. Right, so you can basically pretty reliably extract URL links. And search engines and scientific meta search engines were doing it since 1997. I was in the group which built the original site here, right, which was the meta search engine for scientific literature. So, so you can kind of, we call it bottom up, right, like parse the internet. Now you, there are companies like SourceGraph, uh, there is, I think, was a company which is a sponsor here, which basically, you know, given the code base, right, like, understand the dependencies. And, and obviously, you can piggyback on this supply, software uh, supply chain work, right? So you can kind of say, OK, like, give me the links to software from papers, extract automatically. Then go parse the dependency graph and give me dependencies and classify this. Right? So like this, this is a legitimate direction. The problem is, if you look at GitHub, it's littered by like dead repositories, which are clones. Right, then scientists are the last people to kind of think of carefully maintaining, deduplicating the repositories. There are students use them, right, for the class projects. So, so I think the source of truth is hard to find. So, so we realized very quickly we do need some seeding. So we need basically these interest groups, which we have as a social backbone of this initiative. We want them to do something of this nature, right? And so a very simple ask is, ask a scientist, give me five tools you or your colleagues are using. Let's do, ask them, right? And let's not overburden them, but you, like, we're not chemists. Until we started to look at chemistry, we didn't know, you know, about RDKit. And RDKit turns out to be number one package used by computational chemists. To the tune that, you know, a company Syngenta, which is a fertilizer company, now has a full-time person and supports uh, RGKit because it's used by computational chemists. Like, this is the kind of stuff we want. We want open source, which is judged to be critical by practitioners. And obviously, like a few people cannot find it, all of this. Like you need to delegate it to you know, people in, in disciplines. And so our job is kind of to find the, the right folks then who can ask the right questions. And even not just just two of us, but the respective chairs of the interest groups. So we kind of first of all, we believe we do need this kind of uh, good working uh, organization, which will properly like eventually whatever st stuff you find, humans need to review it, right? So so we, we need to work on this. Uh, one approach is obviously map people want to be on the map. So research gate is like if you guys publish any papers anywhere, you are receiving spam from academia.edu and the research gate who says, you know, hey, John Smith, is it you who wrote this paper cited by John Doe, you know, in this conference? And of course, you're now very curious what they said about you, right? And, and then you want to go there and say, pay eight bucks a month and we'll tell you, right? Like this is obviously a growth hack and we'll not charge them eight bucks. So hopefully people will come, but there are many ideas. Like we're open to ideas. You know, we kind of think we'll, we have 
kind of champions of open source and science are passionate enough to give us some thoughts top down, we can then use data mining to link it from bottom up. And we are very open to ideas. Like, if you know good ways to motivate scientists, connect with us and let us know. Other questions? Or any ideas or feedback? I mean, does it make sense? Would you use this map, for instance, to help a science project? So we need to motivate open source developers too. So, all okay. right. So that's basically our context. If you guys have ideas, you know, they have the saying, like, good ideas come on the way out. If you have feedback, if you are interested, if you have colleagues in science and open source who cares about science, right, send them here. And we basically are set up to welcome people. We had our table. We're going to be wrapping up, but we had our booth. We had basically 100 people came to us and learned about us. Thank you for doing that. So, and we'll be now on, like, I think hopefully at many of the Linux uh, open source summits. Uh, we also at PyData conferences. They are run by now Focus. So if you see PyData meet up in your area, come say hi, send some people. So we're very tight with the PyData network, which is now around anywhere. Like they run PyData New York. Uh, there is PyData Global, which has held PyData Amsterdam. So that's a very fun place for open source science and data science. All right. Thank you very much.